Well, when he sent me this, he wrote a sweet, lovely letter saying, Neville, I, I must confess, I didn't see it. No one saw it until Professor Feynman in his lab discovered this. But he discovered it by theory. And you tell me, you know it by vision. You're not a scientist, and yet all that you said to me, which I could not believe, and even in this moment, it's difficult for me to believe, here comes a great professor, a theoretical physicist, and he is the one who wrote this paper. For that, he got the Nobel Prize last year. I'll go back now to 1949. I was in Milwaukee. I gave a series of lectures on the Bible. And this couple, he was a physicist, the head physicist of Alice Chalmers. They're a huge, big manufacturing firm making these turbines, sometimes bigger than this interior. And he was the head of the chemical department where they were saying water from all over the world who bought the turbine. And he would analyze the water to discover the problem that they faced. Well, being a trained chemist and the head of the department, he didn't take issue with me, but he said, Neville, I can't quite go along with you. Because as a chemist, it's in conflict with my training. You tell me that you can go forward in time, that you can move backwards in time, that all things are. And everything is now, at this very moment. And yet you're telling me you can make things change and it's in conflict with my training. We have a law known, said he, and we call it entropy. And entropy means that the past is fixed and unalterable. You cannot change it. If that could be changed, it throws everything out of kilter in my lab. I must know the past is unalterable, like braiding a lady's hair. And the braided part, that's fixed. The rest is future, not yet braided. We are waiting to see how it will develop from the braided part. Because that is completely fixed and unalterable. And you tell me it is not. That the whole vast world exists now. Past, present, and future. And that you can go into these sections of time in a world that is finished. Well, I can't go along with that. That's perfectly all right. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a scientist, so I cannot argue the point with you. I only know my visions. And I teach vision as I have actually experienced it. And I can go into these spots. I have gone into these places and the past has not passed away. And it's fixed as you say, but I'm quite sure one could go back and revise that past and change it. And I can go forward into the future that I do know and set it up to walk across a bridge of incident. When I come to that point in time where I have entered, it takes on the color and the tone and the reality that I assumed it to be when I entered that state. Can't be done. But he was a very honest man, as most of these fellows are. They're trained to be honest. How else could they achieve what they do achieve in science unless they're perfectly honest with themselves? Well, in the month of November, I received a letter from him. And he sent me the science newsletter dated October the 15th. And it was all about the positron. And the one who wrote it was Professor Richard Feynman. He was then professor of physics at Cornell University. Twenty years later, only last year, they granted him the Nobel Prize in Physics for that paper. It took them twenty years to recognize what he said as theory back in 1949. And if I can quote it, this is it. The positron is a wrong way electron. It's wrong way in every sense of the word. It moves backwards in time. It moves from where it hasn't been and speeds to where it was an instant ago. Arriving there, it is bunked so hard, its time sense is reversed and it moves back to where 
it hasn't been. Now that is not Neville speaking, that is Professor Feynman, for that he got the Nobel Prize last year. He said it's not only backwards in that sense, but even its charge is backwards. It's a positron, it's positive and not negative, and yet it is an electron. When they first observed it, or rather had it as theory, they did not want to admit it, but yet it fitted in with Einstein's theory, mathematically. So they had to in some way accept it, but no one had ever photographed it. Then came someone who photographed it in their studies of the cosmic rays, and here it was the actual positron. Well, I told him that I was sitting at home, and I would go into a section of time, even uh, this year, for instance. This is now only April. I put myself in Christmas. I could hear the musical Christmas, all the carols. I'd walk through Saks Fifth Avenue in New York City, go into Best, go into the other, and I would feel all that I would feel if it were true that it's Christmas, that it's the month of Christmas. And then when I feel that it's all Christmas, then I would feel that things are as I desire them to be back in the month, say, of March or July, which was certainly not Christmassy. So take a hot, hot day in July, and I'm feeling it to be cold and snow on the ground and all the dressings for Christmas. And then I would open my eyes and bounce back and shock myself because it seemed so real to me that when I came back, and opened my eyes upon July, and it's hot. I thought, now, are you kidding yourself? No, when I went forward in time, quite normally, waiting out the days, the months, to the month of December, things happened as I actually had assumed that they would. I went forward and determined, predetermined, what would happen. Well, when he sent me this, he wrote a sweet, lovely letter, saying, Neville, I, I must confess, I didn't see it, no one saw it until Professor Feynman in his lab discovered this. But he discovered it by theory. And you tell me, you know it by vision. You're not a scientist, and yet all that you said to me, which I could not believe, and even in this moment, it's difficult for me to believe. Here comes a great professor, a theoretical physicist, and he is the one who wrote this paper. For that, he got the Nobel Prize last year. He worked on our atomic bomb. He worked on the hydrogen bomb. Then he asked the government to relieve him of the secrecy imposed upon him because of his position. And he came here to Caltech and taught at Caltech theoretical physics. He said, I want the freedom of imagination. I said, I want to be confined with the secrets of government so that I could not express myself. Leave me alone, all in theory. So he goes blindly on with his mathematics and his theory, bringing out these concepts, all theory. Well, mine is not theory. I go into these states. Now, look at it this way. See the whole vast world as infinite states. All states. If they're all states and you are an immortal being, you're not a state, you are immortal. You enter a state and the state becomes alive. Therefore, you are not to blame if you enter a state unwittingly, and it's a horrible state. Man not knowing that you are in a state, they condemn you. But you have to express the contents of that state. <coughs> if you enter the state of poverty, you have to experience poverty. If you remain in it, you must go and drink that to the very last drop, the dregs of that cup. If you go into any state and remain in that state, you're going to drink it to the very last drop. But you can get out of a state. You don't have to remain in it if you know it's a state. If you don't know it's a state, you identify yourself with the state and think that you're it. 